TCP is dead, long live TCP. Okay, first of all, let's just get something out of the way right away, people, the good people, the good packet people that are here in class or in this session with me. Yeah, we're titled intro to quick. Is it gonna kill TCP, the TCP killer? We'll find out. I, I'm gonna, I'm, that's a cliffhanger, right? I'm not gonna tell you right away, but we are gonna learn a little bit about the quick protocol. Welcome to the session. It's great to have you all here. Uh, if we haven't met already, um, and I didn't have you in the pre-conference class, I'm kind of bummed about that. That would have been cool to have met you in the pre-conference class, but no worries. We're here together. We're going to spend some time. Okay, so my name is Chris Greer. Welcome to this session. I work for a company called Packet Pioneer. Uh, I'm a consultant. I, I like to look at packets. I like to see what's going on on networks today and um, try to help things work better. Right? I think that's why we're all here in, in, at SharkFest. It's nice to be here with fellow packet people. Um, when I'm not doing a session like this, or if I'm not doing a pre-conference class like the one that was earlier this week, I also like to post information out there on YouTube. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, come check it out. Um, uh, at Packet Pioneer is my handle on Twitter and you can follow along with that. So, all right, so let's go ahead and get into our content. First of all, we're going to talk about the quick protocol. Now, quick, it's kind of a big deal. Okay, so we're going to break it down. I'm first going to talk about a little bit of history, some of the background behind quick. Um, why is it needed? Why has it taken so long for a competitor to TCP to come around at the transport layer? Um, what are our expectations for the future with quick? Okay, so we're going to kind of piece by piece go through this protocol. Um, just as a sidebar, if you have not done so already, make sure that you have the quick CTF PCAP, because I'm going to be just showing you a few things from that PCAP, and I'm going to um, not answer the CTF questions for you, but since that's a PCAP that so many people have access to uh, that are jumping into this session, I'm just going to use that to, to demonstrate some of the protocol for you. All right, so let's make sure that you have that. If you don't have that yet, uh, then head on out to ctf.wireshark.org and you can um, just create a registration and then go to the quick section and you can, should be able to download it. Um, you can download it from the uh, CTF itself. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get into quick. So first of all, quick, let's be clear about something. The RFC, RFC specifies QUIC is not an acronym. At one point, it was QUIC Internet Connections. However, not anymore. QUIC is literally the name of this protocol. What is it, though? It's a general purpose, reliable transport protocol for web and other applications, but not over TCP. It's over UDP. OK, wait a second. Hang on a second. I just said UDP. What's this? Are we going to go unreliable now? This isn't connection oriented. This is just best effort. This is just throw the ball and hope you catch it kind of stuff. Hang on a second. Isn't that kind of going backwards? Well, not at all. In fact, we're going to see how quick is very TCP like in its behavior. In fact, a lot of the algorithms, the um, uh, retransmission, the congestion, so the loss recovery style of features within quick, a lot of that was borrowed from TCP. Basically what they've done is they've taken decades of experience and, and knowledge that's, that's been learned from TCP and the way that it delivers information and it's just plunked over UDP. We're gonna talk about why that is in a little bit, but basically there's the general definition for quick. In short, it was designed to accelerate web application delivery and make it more secure, okay? But let's go ahead and think about uh, what just happened, okay? so. Quick as a protocol really was born officially. Quick version one uh, was announced to the world in the form of four RFCs dropping on May 27th, 2021. So, woo, finally, yes, we are, we're there. We have uh, Quick is now officially born. It's officially a standard. It's been a long time in coming. The working group has been working on Quick for about five years, right? So now, though, we have RFC. 8999, and that talks about version independent properties. The big bulk of Quick and how it's defined is actually done in RFC 9000. 
it's kind of nice that that just that nice round number RFC 9000 easy to remember and that's what spells out the quick transport protocol itself. Then we're looking at 9001 and 9002 so TLS TLS is built into quick now to secure it and then finally 9002 is loss detection and congestion control. But if you are going to take a read through an RFC, uh, maybe you're up late at night and you need a cure for insomnia, I'm joking, it's not that bad. Go ahead and check out RFC 9000. You can drive through there. It's a, it's a very thoroughly written document about this very important um, movement that just happened at the transport layer. But hold up, let's back up a second. Quick is not brand new. It's actually been around for a while. And now it's actually built in to several browsers and already several different services over the web are already using it. So who, who today is actually using Quick? Well, it's built into Chrome. We see it on Edge. We have it on Firefox. Even Safari has a plugin. So, I mean, browsers are there. Browsers have been building this into their functionality for a while. The thing that has been waiting, though, is to actually flip that switch to make it a default uh, thing that happens right out the gate. All right. So um, on the browser side, the a, a lot of browsers, most common browsers that we see today are already up and available to be able to use quick. Now, on the service side, services are more and more, they're starting to come on board and using quick for web delivery. Uh, of course, the Google services, YouTube, Facebook, um, even apps, even mobile apps for our devices, those also have been going through some testing with Quick. In fact, one I'm sure you've heard of, Uber. Uh, Uber has built Quick into their, um, their application. So their, their app is actually using Quick to communicate to central services, and they found some good performance improvement as well. So basically, just to boil it down, Quick is here. In fact, uh, even this Zoom, it, it's not over quick, but uh, Zoom uses a UDP stream to be able to uh, deliver this between all of each other. It's how you see my screen. It's how you see my uh, see my video, hear my voice. But that's over UDP. But in time, perhaps even a session like this eventually will flip over to quick. And it seems like uh, that's already been um, something that they've been working towards. Okay. So what is Quick? Why do we need it? What's the big deal? Well, first, let's think about the internet martini glass is what I call it. Okay, so think about applications, the number of applications that have come on board, especially in recent years um, with all the apps that have been developed, um, email, voice, video, all the things that we do now over the web or over just transport protocols in general. Uh, anymore now, even with IoT devices, you can control your home networks and you can uh, unlock your front door over TCP, right? So everything has a stack these days and it's communicating. These applications are just built right on top of some of these core protocols that have been there. There's been a lot of development up there. Well, below those applications, to secure those applications, there's also been a development in different core application protocols. How about the protocols that secure those applications? Okay, so we've had SSL, sorry, now SSL 1.0, then 2.0, then 3.0, then we saw TLS starting to take over some of that workload formally, or at least, you know, flipping to the name, and then 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, so things have been cooking along uh, for transport layer security as well, there's been a lot of development there, but then we kind of hit this stick point. Let's think about this for a moment, TCP and UDP. Right, they're, they're sitting on top of IP, IPv6. We've had a lot of development of IPv6. Sure, there's been some data link development too, but I think we'd all agree that TCP and UDP at the transport layer, this is where things have, have been pretty stale for several years. In fact, think about TCP as a standard. If we look into the RFC and pull up RFC 793, that's the TCP standard. That guy was written back in 1981. In fact, it was written back in September of 1981. So guess what? TCP this month is 40 years old. All right. So, wow, there, that's quite a statement, isn't it? I think to me, to me, it uh, really speaks to the resilience of the protocol. I mean, think about how old this protocol is. Yes, it's, it's been uh, adjusted. There's been some new algorithms within TCP that have been more efficient with taking advantage of today's networks for sure. 
but the core protocol itself is about 40 years old now. Amazing, right? And same thing with UDP. UDP, is so the, the, at the transport layer, there hasn't been a lot of um, uh, new things coming on board, really like new applications. We've just been dropping them on top of these transport layer protocols that have done a good job for a long amount of time. They've been enough. They've done well, so hey, why change it, right? Well, that is until now. We've seen quite a bit of, um, uh, we're, we're, we've started to hit some points where TCP is being stretched to the limit, and now we're starting to see the need to move to a new type of transport protocol. But first, let's talk about why that's not an easy thing to do. How come we can't just create TCP 2.0? or create a completely new transport layer protocol. Well, the thing about TCP, it's, it's hard to replace. It's hard to move away from TCP. And the reason is because it's baked into so many systems. It's been around for 40 years. So firewalls are used to it. Load balancers expect it. IDS systems, IPS systems, they know how to do deep packet inspection and look for specific things within TCP. WAN accelerators know how to manipulate it. Middle boxes know how to adjust it and, and make it faster. NAT expects TCP behavior, right? So our networks today know, love, and adjust TCP. They're used to it. In fact, if one little thing changes within TCP, a lot of times now that can trigger an alert. Right, so even if you, let's just say that you had a SIN go out there and it had no TCP options. Okay, I send a TCP SIN to another box and there's no options at all. Well, some intrusion detection systems might go, oh, weird, this is a weird looking SIN. Where's this from? What's, what's going on here? And that's just because I make a, a slight little adjustment or if I just change what is normal in the slightest way. Right, so really TCP is baked in and it's tough to adjust. This is why I can't just take a new transport layer protocol, dump it on top of IP and then hope everything works out well. Let's invent a name, okay? Let's talk about CTP. That's actually the Chris transport protocol. Let's imagine if we just created a new competitor to TCP and we said, okay, Chris transport protocol. So I'm gonna have HTTP, on top of TLS 1.3, on top of Chris Transport Protocol, on top of IP. So what's gonna happen? How far is that thing gonna go when networks without running into something that's broken or, or not prepared to handle it? Well, it won't take long. In fact, the first firewall is gonna be like, who are you? What is this protocol? What's CTP? Who's ever heard of this? Forget that, I'm not passing this through. I don't know you. I don't know you like that, right? So it would take, upgrading my firewalls, it would take upgrading or adjusting or patching my IDS IPS systems, my WAN accelerators, my NAT system. So it would take a lot of, it would take several years to get everything else patched to be able to support this new protocol, right? And, and that would be a lot of pain in the meantime. It would be really tough to just roll that out and get it cooking. On top of that, we also see where the network tries to help. The network tries to uh, do things to where, with this is with TCP, but the network can adjust MSS. Uh, they can terminate connections. Um, the network is so used to TCP, it actually can almost get in our way. And a new transport protocol on top of IP, it would, it would be tough to roll out. Kernel stacks wouldn't know what to do with it, network infrastructure, and so on. So this is what can make TCP tough to move forward from. It's not as easy as just throwing out a new protocol. But now, because so many systems, we call it, have ossified, that's ossification, they baked in, they, they expect and they know, and they love and breathe TCP, it's hard to move forward from. But why would we want to move forward from TCP anyway? I mean, the world handles it. It carries our important stuff. Our mission-critical applications are running across TCP. So what's wrong? Well, if we think about it, like we said, it's an old protocol, right? Uh, there have been some improvements in TCP options since RFC 793 was first rolled out back in September of 1981. Also, there's been improvement in congestion control algorithms. 
Yes, it's reliable, it's connection oriented. It is used to carry most application traffic in the world. These are all true. However, with TCP, what's wrong with it? Well, being packet people looking at TCP in, in Wireshark, one of the things that we have enjoyed is we get to see the whole TCP header. It's great. We can see sequence numbers, we can see acknowledgement numbers, we can see TCP flags, we can, uh, we can see the window sizes. We can see the options that are exchanged within a handshake. So we can get down to the packet level and we have quite a bit of visibility at the transport layer with TCP. And that's great, right? For us as analysts, especially even in encrypted flows, we can still go quite a bit down the road without needing to decrypt uh, an application to be able to troubleshoot, to be able to tell, okay, is this, are, are we having a problem with network packet loss? Uh, is TCP able to recover? Uh, oh, check out some of these other factors within TCP that we can use to troubleshoot. Great. That's because the header is wide open. It's not encrypted. All of TCP, see, encryption hand, is handled just one layer above us with that TLS layer. It's like sitting on our heads. But once TLS does its thing and drops the data set down for TCP to segment and send, well, now we have access to that whole header space. That's a bad thing when it comes to security. How about options? Well, now anymore, we're out of TCP option space for new options, okay? So what does that mean? Well, basically, if you take any packet and you take a look at a TCP SYN, and if you were in my class, we certainly did that together. So if we take a look at our TCP SYN, we have the TCP headers, uh, and then at the very end, we have TCP options, and those options are exchanged in the handshake and those options allow us to communicate some of the parameters and also through the stream, not just in the handshake, we can also use those parameters like, for example, SAC or timestamps. Uh, we can see those options continue to be communicated to the other link partner. But just due to the little limitation within the TCP header that specifies that the header itself cannot be any longer than six, 60 bytes, okay? That leaves 20 bytes for standard TCP header values, support numbers, window size, sequence number, acknowledgement number, all those kind of standard things. But then we only have room for 40 bytes of option space within TCP, okay? That's all that the present standard that we're working with will allow. What that means is that we can't really bring in new features. Um, SAC, uh, time stamping, all the ones that I just mentioned, those can take up a lot of space, right, in those, in those options. So if I was to bring up a new TCP option, now I'm running out of room. I only have a couple bytes left over to do any kind of new thing with TCP, right? And even if I did that, even if I brought out, let's just say the, the Chris option with TCP that makes some part of it more efficient, well, uh, not only am I running out of option space, but now I would have to take all the new, I would have to enable all the firewalls and middle boxes, anybody that touches that TCP header from one endpoint to another, they would all need to know what to do with it, what to, what to or how to understand it, whether to forward it or not, and to not look like I'm doing some type of weird attack or something like that uh, into the system. Another limitation with TCP is connections don't migrate to new networks well. All right, so if I'm sitting in my office, I've got my phone, I'm taking a look at a video or something, or I'm, I'm checking my email, and I walk from the office out to my car and I flip from my corporate Wi-Fi wi and I go over to the LTE network, well, as soon as I jump networks and my four tuple changes, so my source IP, my source port, destination IP, destination port, as soon as that happens between endpoints, see the two endpoints can be the same, but when there's a change in network for tuple, TCP doesn't like that. TCP breaks. So a lot of times TCP is like, yeah, forget, I'm not going to do that whole multi-path thing. I'm not going to, I can't jump to new connections very well. And TCP struggles with that. So this is another consideration with how things would need to move forward. We're jumping across networks and we wanna have seamless service from one network to another. Why else? What else is wrong you, could you say with TCP? Well, we already talked a little bit about the limited room to change in the header values. We, we also need to discuss head of line blocking. I've got a slide that goes deeper into this. 
But fundamentally, if TCP in a stream of data, if I lose any of that traffic, any traffic behind that basically gets held up because TCP is going to be like, oh man, I lost something. I lost something. Hey guys, hold up, chill out. I lost this packet. I lost this packet. It does basically stunt the rest of my communication until that those that byte, the, that stream is replaced and then TCP can move, move along. Now we've seen that in Wireshark, I'm sure. You're going through a trace file and all of a sudden you see black lines, red letters, scary, and then TCP retransmits and then it clears out and then we move along with our stream. Well, at the application layer, that can actually cause some headaches, especially now that we're moving into multiplex communications um, at the application layer. I got a slide that goes into a bit more of that, but basically just remember that head of line blocking is a limitation because TCP is that choke point. And finally, network round trips. Uh, really quick uh, from the get-go was um, the, the design consideration moving into quick was, okay, why don't we strip down and limit as many network round trips as possible? That way we're not eating the network latency as often or as much to do so with as few round trips as possible. That was one of the goals. Now, I told you I did have a slide for head of line blocking. So let's talk about this again. So what do we mean by this? Reading into quick, this is something you're absolutely gonna hear about out there. So let's imagine that we have this connection between these two endpoints. Here, I've got a client on the left, I got my server on the right, and they're having a TCP connection. Now, nice thing about, if you haven't done much analysis of HTTP2 over TLS 1.3 over TCP, I have an example that I'm gonna show you in just a moment. But one thing, one advantage to HTTP2 is we can do something called multiplexed application requests. We can have several streams that are managed, but they're over one TCP connection. So in the old days, I would have to do, I would have to start a new TCP connection, ask one question, just do get one, get the response, then do get two, get the response, then do get three, get the response. I would have to basically put those down, down that uh, stream one at a time. But with HTTP2, see, now I can do get one, get two, get three. You know, I can have several gets go out there at once over a single TCP stream. Well, let's imagine, though, I send out all these requests to the server. And one of these streams, or one of, I'm sorry, one of these segments goes missing in the TCP stream. Let's look at this for a moment. You've already got all of get one. You've completely received get one. One part of get two went missing, but you received all of get three. You see, technically, and I'm just simplifying this, okay, just, just to, to show you on this slide. Technically, you've already received get three, so you should be able to go ahead and start responding to get three, right? Doesn't that make sense? That get three did arrive at the server. But TCP being TCP, it notices below the gets, down at the TCP header, at the transport layer, I have missing pieces of the stream data. TCP doesn't know anything about these gets. It doesn't know that, oh, I got all get three. So, hey, application, here you go, get three. Here you go, get one. Let me, let me just figure out this get two thing. And once I have get two, then I'll give get two upstairs. No, instead, TCP is like, I have a missing piece of data. It doesn't have any context to what that data is. So what happens in this scenario? Well, the server, it got get one because that happened before my point of loss. TCP was able to reassemble it, send it upstairs. So it begins responding to, to on my first one. But before I can begin responding to get three, first I got to handle get two. I finally get get two, and then I can finally do get three. So this is the idea behind something we call head of line blocking. And that's where a single, if I lose something with TCP, TCP is going to freak out, first of all. It's going to want to get that retransmission. And then once it has a solid byte stream, it can begin to further process it. So even though you got get three after the point of loss or you, you completely receive that get, you can't begin to uh, process and issue that response until uh, TCP gets everything and sends it upstairs. So it just becomes a choke point, right? That's something that was one of the... Um, considerations behind moving forward with another uh, option at the transport layer. Okay, blah, 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 mouthful. Let's go ahead and back up a bit. So now we're going to talk 
about quick. We've seen why we've reached this point with TCP where we've needed something else. We've needed to expand the internet martini glass and make it more of a straight glass. And really where, where uh, we could start to have another option at the transport layer. Enter the world quick. Let's go ahead and see how this guy came into the world and what its development cycle has been like. And then we're actually gonna get into the packets and do some crunching together. So let's go ahead and go back to 2012. Okay, a little teeny company called Google. I'm joking. When, you know what, we gotta make this internet thing faster. And we realize that TCP is a choke point that eventually is gonna need some development there. So they are in a unique position because they have both the services and the client side with Chrome, that they were, be able, they were able to do some tinkering and start to make some adjustments at the transport layer, but do so at scale. Like they could send out, um, they, they could begin to do some development here. And all of us, the consumers, could basically be some of the guinea pigs that tested out for them, right? So actually back then is when they first um, broke ground on a new option at the transport layer. And at that time, it was an acronym, QUIC was. So QUIC UDP Internet Connections. And different protocols, or different names also came about. Speedy, you might have heard of that. Um, but Google was kind of the groundbreaker here. So they went, all right, we're gonna have another option here. So let's go ahead and start tinkering. Let's see if we can start delivering some of our services over UDP and um, not have to have some of those limitations with TCP. So that's what happened back in 2012. Well, development went well on this. So in 2016, that's when Google said, all right, things are happening here. Hey, IETF, uh, let's go ahead and standardize this guy so it can be more than just us, you know? And so that's when the quick project, if you will, was handed over to the ITF. And that's when the quick working group was formed. So basically 2016, that's where it was like, all right, let's bring this thing to standard. So now it can be rolled out to the world and used beyond just web. So now things like um, application or mobile apps, APIs, things can be written around quick that now will be able to um, utilize this transport layer model, this, this new thing that just came around. Well, that was five years ago. So literally for the past five years, the quick working group has been working on um, Quick version one. Now that's not to say that Quick just came out to the internet in May 2021. In fact, if you start up a packet capture, start up Wireshark and go hit a YouTube video, um, you would have seen the Quick protocol and it's been around for a while. Even the dissector uh, has been around for, for a little bit. So at least a couple of years. So Quick is not new, but version one is. Right, so we've seen met several different drafts of Quick, or, or basically uh, moving toward that final standard. Um, we we've seen that develop over the last couple of years. So I think the last draft that they had was draft 34, and then after that, version one was born. Okay, so this is some of the the history of Quick, and how it came to us today, and why it did. But now what we want to do is look a little deeper into what are some of the strengths that it brings to the party and what, are, what's, what does it look like under the hood? So basically up until this point, here you can see a standard web stack over there on the left. Here we have HTTP2. Uh, that application needs to be encrypted some way. That doesn't happen at the application layer. So that dumps data down to our transport layer security. Um, 1.3 right now is, is pretty wide, widely implemented. Of course, if not 1.2, it's 1.3. That's a, a lot of what we're seeing these days. And then that is then given to TCP to have a reliable stream of data be transported to the other side. And then you have your carrier IP or IPv6. Great. However, how does that map over or what's a, how, yeah, how do these functions map over to the quick stack? Well, over on the quick stack, okay, if we start from the bottom and go up, this is where we can see IP, IPv6, doesn't matter. And then UDP. Now, UDP, let's not get hung up on that part of the stack. Really, the only reason why Quick is going over UDP is so that it can take advantage of basically every operating system and kernel in the, in the world. All of them support TCP and UDP, 
right? If it's not TCP and TCP, those are the two big ones. So really the reason for UDP is that we couldn't put QUIC directly on top of IP. That would have taken a lot of development for, to get everything else up to speed to support it. But instead, just using UDP to get in the front door in a kernel, that's the reason why QUIC was dropped on top of UDP, just to make it a simple way of getting in the front door. I mean, really, UDP, it's only eight bytes. It's a couple ports and a checksum. It's in a length field. It's, it's a very simple protocol. So again, Quick is just taking advantage of the fact that it's already everywhere. And now we can quickly adopt the Quick protocol. Moving up from there, if you look at Quick and just see, notice how this box kind of stretches down and takes over some of the TCP functions. So if we think of reliability, so retransmissions, flow control, um, making sure that we have a solid stream, those functions are built into the QUIC protocol. So don't think of QUIC as connectionless, unreliable, just because it's sitting on top of UDP. It's not. It's actually brilliantly reliable, just like TCP. It handles retransmission. It handles flow control. Uh, in fact, a lot of the flow control algorithms are very similar, if not exactly the same, to the ones that we've had to study with TCP. So think uh, TCP cubic. Think um, compound TCP, just any of those, those types of uh, algorithms that you've had to understand and learn about with TCP, um, some of those are, are alive and well in the, the quick stack itself. Now, TLS, instead of TLS being a separate thing altogether, now TLS is actually built into Quick. All right. So TLS is. Um, now you can't really separate it from Quick. So, like in Wireshark, you know how you have you have your application, you have your your TLS basically layer, and then that says sits on top of your transport layer. Well, now you only see TLS in the initial hit packets of, of Quick. Then after that, it's built in, and that encryption already um, already happens. It's already built into that application. Okay, so this is just a bit about the stack. Let me just check my questions. I just had another one in. Um, so quick would replace HSTS on HTTP one. Quick will replace TCP and TLS. So anything that's handed down that would take advantage of the, that transport protocol, that's what it's engineered from the, the ground up to replace. Let me check the chat real quick too. Da, 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 da. Okay. All right. All right. So let's uh, let's keep going here. So let's answer the question that you came here to find out. Is Quick going to completely kill TCP? Well, eventually, Quick is poised to replace many, if not most, services over the web. So websites. You go out to uh, Google.com. You're checking Gmail. Uh, you're going out to uh, YouTube. If you have to Facebook, you're already over quick. Uh, if you're going out to any type of uh, website that's front-ended on a CDN. So a lot of those are already, if they haven't already, they're poised to flip over to quick. Cloudflare. Um, I know at the, I, I was reading about the last quick working group meeting, um, Amazon, AWS, and, and even services like Netflix and Amazon Prime. I mean, these are all um, services that are poised to flip over to Quick. Now, does that immediately make them faster? Does it immediately mean that, okay, wonderful, all of our problems are solved because we're on Quick now? Well, not at all. Quick is still new. Quick is still a baby. It can hardly walk. So systems haven't been optimized to deal well with Quick yet, right? It's still these, there's still some maturity that needs to happen, but over time, as systems prioritize it, uh, learn how to make it more efficient, absolutely, this is something we're going to start to see. Even Microsoft, they were doing some research and thinking about how you can move SMB over to Quick instead of having it over TCP. And it's expected that even internal in applications that are running, you know, some of our, our business applications could begin to, we could see that flip over to Quick. Okay, so will it kill TCP? No. TCP is around for a long time. So if you've spent time looking into Quick and how to 
uh, analyze it, how to understand this amazing protocol to transport layer, your time's not wasted. TCP is still going to be here for a while. Okay, TCP is not going anywhere. But over the web, we're going to see Quick continue to gain that foothold. So don't rest in peace, Quick uh, TCP. You'll still be around for a while. It's all good. Now, when will Quick have an advantage here? So what will when does Quick win? Well, the working group had published a lot of pa papers about um, Quick and its best use case. Really, Quick is not so much for large data transfers. Okay, so if you're downloading a file, if you're backing up a database, um, if you're doing those types of heavier data sets, uh, that's really not Quick's wheelhouse. Where it is an advantage to use Quick, if you have a lot of small transfers happening, less than a few megabytes of data transfer per transaction, Quick might be better. And that's a quote from Lars Eager. He was a one of the founding fathers of, uh, of Quick in the working group. So if basically web activity, right? We go up to a web server, we need to pull down a lot of different smaller files. Uh, Quick could be a better way to do that, especially so, since we're not eating up as many round trips, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Okay. Now, some obstacles moving forward for Quick. Well, firewalls don't really support it yet, not all. They're coming on board to support it, and as far as inspecting it, um, not all kernels are optimized to support it. So Quick is still heavy on some systems. There's a lot of um, there's some heavy lifting that happens within the Quick stack. So not all systems are optimized yet. IDS and DN and I, IPS boxes still uh, might have a struggle monitoring it yet. The load balancers aren't quickable yet. Um, an improvement in performance may not be worth reworking applications just yet. So I know in speaking in, in some circles, some have felt, well, you know, why, why move everything over to this quick thing if I'm not going to see a big, import, uh, a big performance improvement yet? So there's still some op, um, obstacles for quick to overcome. It may be some time before these are yet fully worked out, but we do see that uh, this is the future for a lot of web-based applications. Okay. Daryl has a great question. Thank you, Daryl Brooks. He says, does Quick have any features baked in that make it easier to troubleshoot and analyze versus TCP? It seems like it only makes it more complicated and difficult. Boy, okay, that's a great question, Daryl. So does Quick, as analysts, does Quick help you and me out any more? Does it help us do our jobs better as analysts? I hate to tell you, but no. It's <laughs> if anything, it's a lot harder to analyze than even TCP. So if TCP's been a struggle, Quick boy, whoo, Quick is a can be a monster, right? But that said, not impossible. A big thing about um, Quick and analyzing Quick is it's we in order to make it any make any headway into actually seeing the protocol, we got to be able to de decrypt it. We got to be able to actually see what's going on because Quick encrypts so much of its header of what it's actually doing, right? Okay, so speaking of which, I mean, I've been kind of talking to you guys a lot, right? And um, if you were in my class over the weekend, uh, you know, something that you know about me is I don't like to do a ton of talking. I like to do showing and doing. So let's go ahead and flip over to, let me share my screen here. Um, I'd like to show you about some tools that you can use to start, start to get some experience with Quick and with HTTP3, which it's on top of Quick, okay? So first of all, I'd like to show you HTTP3check.net. Let's have everybody go there. Go ahead and fire up a browser. Uh, go ahead and hit that. I'm gonna throw this out in the chat. Okay, so just, uh, this is one of many tools. There's lots of these out there. So this is by far not the only one, but this is where you can test to see, is your site quick capable? Does your site have the ability to support quick in the first place? So come in here to HTTP3, check. Let's go ahead and come in here and I'm just gonna type in wireshark.org, site we know and love, let's do a check. And this is gonna come back and tell us, cool. So wireshark.org where it is hosted, is supported. Quick is supported and it does support HTTP3. Also, we can see the 
the flavors of Quick that are supported here. So we can go all the way back to H3, draft 27, draft 28, draft 29, uh, full H3. Um, so there's some other stuff we can see. I mean, for me, I, I'm just gonna check packetpioneer.com. All right, am I Quick capable? Sure am. Here's my question. I want all of you guys to throw in your company webpage and then come on the chat and tell me, are you Quick capable? Thumbs up or no? Let's go ahead and uh, throw it out to the chat. If you're if you're good with quick, say good for your company page. If not, that's okay. If you say no, that's all right. No problem. Oh, I'm just gonna see. Uh, I don't know what's another one. NFL. Ah. <laughs> it's football season, people. Okay, so but that starts to 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 show you. Okay, some some people are saying that not through proxy, so it could be that quick is just being completely. Um, uh, not supported at this time at that level. But going through, um, well, let's go ahead and talk about getting up to speed a bit more on Quick, some, another tool that's nice to use. So that was HTTP3 check. And another one that I've been using quite a bit just to do some analysis is just the developer tools that are built within my web browser. Okay, so I can go over to, if you're on Chrome, um, this also exists on Firefox and other web browsers too. Uh, but, but opening up the developer tools can help us to take a look at requests as they go to systems and then be able to see is quick supported. So I'm going to go ahead and just come up here to my Chrome stuff. I'm going to go down here to tools. I'm going to come down here to developer tools. All right. So options, more tools, developer tools. Then what I can see on the bottom of my page here. Uh, now I have the, the developer tools ready, so I can start to see some extra stuff about some of the conversations I'm about to have. I'm just going to type in wireshark.org, hit enter. And if we notice, this is where I'm going to focus, protocol. Okay, so I'm just going to jump up to the top. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay, so I knock on the door of wireshark.org, and I do so over HTTP2, which is over... TLS, which is over TCP. So that first knock on the door that I have to Cloudflare is, hey, what's going on? Let's have a conversation. How are you doing, Wireshark.org? But if you notice, not much further down, H3. So by the time I get here, and really there's several down below it too to Cloudflare, this is where I actually flip and use H3 to deliver or to um, re request and deliver some of the content of wireshark.org. So this is a great way to just check out um, uh, the, the diff the, what type of protocol that my browser is using to go pull some of these pages and what that looks like line by line. So it's just another way to get some, a little bit of experience moving forward. But I think we all came here to ask this question or, or look at this a little closer with Wireshark, right? Let's actually get into the packet level and start to see how some of this looks really on the, the wire, all right? What are some things that uh, we should expect to see? And what are some troubleshooting tips with Quick? And how can we move forward um, with implementing this protocol? All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to uh, open up, uh, let me open up my little copy of Wireshark here, or do I already have it running? Okay, so let me just check, check Q&A as well. Browsing, 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 browsing. Oh, question from Juan. Um, does HTTP3 run only run over quick? Yes, so H2. Basically, H2 and H3 are fundamentally very similar, um, but H3 op is optimized over quick. H, H3 and Quick basically are the chicken and the egg. <laughs> they, they, uh, they go together. Um, H2 is not capable of running over Quick, right? So basically, yeah. So H3 is over Quick. All right. I'm going to go ahead and head back into my trace file. So this is a trace file that I have. Um, you know what I'm going to do? Let me see if I can. Did I cut and paste? No. Okay. Actually, you know what, everybody, give me one second, because I'm going to see if I can get you this trace file I'm about to use. Copy. You guys want to go see if you can get this? 
Go ahead and click on that. Someone tell me if they were able to get it. This is our, uh, this is a, a, there's two files that you can open up. One is the actual trace file itself and the other is a decryption key. All right, so you guys go ahead and get it. It's a small file, shouldn't be too much. Cool, thanks for the chat, everyone. It looks like a bunch of people able to get it, so that's good. All right, so this is called, oops, I need to share my screen again. Share, desktop, share, cool, done, awesome. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of quick analysis. Let's just get to it. This is what we came here for. All right. So uh, this is the quick YouTube TLS PCAP NG. And I went ahead and uh, gave you the key log. So the, what you do with that key log is you, you're just gonna come up to Wireshark preferences, or you're gonna go to edit preferences. Depends on your system. If you're on Windows, or if you're on Linux, you can go over to edit preferences. If you're on a Mac system, let's go to Wireshark preferences. And then what we're going to do is head, hit to protocols. We're going to expand that. And then I'm going to hit the T key. I'm going to come down, take a walk down to TLS. And this is where you can, you can feed that log to Wireshark, all right? So you want the pre-master secret log file name. Go ahead and hit browse and feed it that log file, OK? All right, so this is just a very simple knock on the door to YouTube. Okay, and in fact, I did this. Let me come up to statistics, capture file properties. This happened earlier this year in January. Okay, was, was when I actually captured this. All right, so I'll literally start capture, went to YouTube, stop capture once it pulled up, okay? So if we notice first thing, so I'm doing my DNS um, query and I'm, I'm just gonna kind of expand this down a little bit. I'm in my quick profile, right? And I have some some quick stuff I'm gonna show you. But basically, so I do my DNS request and then immediately after that, I turn around and I do a TCP SYN to the YouTube front door. Okay, that's at 172.217. I get my SYN act back, ACK, and then I send a client hello. Okay, so standard, plain, let's start up talking TCP, port 443, stuff we're used to. Um, you know, not too much special just yet. So server hello, encrypted extension, certificate, all the above. But what I wanna do is I wanna come down here to packet number 22. Check out, this is where we can see that we have a get. Now, if you notice over here in protocol, if you have that column available there, you can see that this is HTTP2. Now, if this is encrypted, I don't see this. All I see is TLS 1.3 and past TLS, I just see encrypted data stream, but I can't actually determine what that stream is and what it's doing because it's encrypted. Right, but here, since we have the key log, we're below that. So again, packet 22. And if I come down to my header stuff, so I've got layer two, layer three, layer four, I got TLS. Then I've got the application sitting on top of it. So the thing that HTTP2 does is it carries the idea of streams, okay? So this, the, the, the application itself is responsible for setting up and using these streams. Now think of a stream almost like, if you would, it's almost like its own TCP stream in a way, right? It's, I can send a get down that stream and then I wait for a response and then I can send another get down that stream. But on top of TCP, I can have a bunch of different streams. So HTTP2, that's how it can multiplex requests going to a server. It can say get, 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 and it can do so over several different streams, although we're sitting on top of one TCP conversation. So that's why with Wireshark, we can see over here headers and then this 15 here. Well, that 15 is telling us this is, this is over stream ID 15, and that's where we're doing our get. So let's go ahead and focus. In fact, it's kind of fun. If you right-click this packet, go down to follow, HTTP2 stream, yeah, kind of cool. If I did that, I can come over here and just see, see what's, uh, what's inside all them packets, although this is not super useful to me right now. I'm going to close it. What I want to see is, okay, here's the packets that are involved in this HTTP2 stream ID 15. And here's my get, and here's my 302 found. So let's all go to packet 28. 
And if I go ahead and take a look at pack 28 and I'm coming down to my header stuff, this is my 302 found, but let's notice what YouTube comes back and tells me. I'd like you to go all, there's a bunch of stuff just for sake of time. We're just gonna really focus on some of the alternate service messages that come back. In fact, if you go all the way down to the bottom, go ahead and come down here with me and find this alternate service, all right? That comes back from the server and notice what it is telling me. This is how the server indicates that it is capable of supporting HTTP3 over draft 29 quick on UDP port 443. So basically uh, YouTube's coming back to me and saying, hey buddy, that's cool that you came and knocked on my front door on TCP, but you know what? We can do this quick thing. So if you're cool, I'm cool. So if you wanna switch over there and come on, hit me back on port 443 UDP, but we'll hook up the draft 29 thing. If you don't support draft 29, then do you support T051? Uh, Q050, any of these other flavors or versions of pre-standard quick, uh, if you support any of these guys, go ahead and come back and hit me. So basically what happens, let's come down here, we're going to remove our filter, and then I'm going to go just a few packets over the, after this, and notice that in packet 33, this is where the client says, cool, I got the hint, let's go ahead and flip over to quick. And then he sends a quick initial packet. So that's called, that, that's basically how we knock on the door. We say, hey, what's going on YouTube? YouTube comes back and says, hey, do you wanna do quick? And if we say, sure, we can do that. If our browser's capable and the network's passing it through and the firewalls are happy as well, then we can uh, flip over to quick. If not, then we can keep using um, YouTube and all those other services over TCP, all right? Now, over time, though, what we expect to see happen, we expect to start seeing quick come out the gate. So instead of doing this knock on the door with TCP, as quick becomes more supported, uh, we start. Well, we should expect to start seeing that just come out the gate. Okay, let's go down to packet 33. This is what we all came to see. I'm going to go ahead and just filter on quick now on packet 33. Um, I'm curious to see what kind of conversations we, we can look at. I want to start digging into the weeds on, on Quick itself. So go ahead and join me there. And I can see that I have two different Quick conversations. Now, for me, in this profile, my Quick profile, I kind of did my thing that I, I do. I, I like to paint my um, handshake packets, or at least the initial packets here in the Quick stream. I, I like to paint those bright green so they jump out to me. It's kind of like my TCP sins and my TCP profiles. But here in quick, I wanted to see those jump out. So uh, go ahead and join me here. I'm going to take a look at packet 33. And let's see what kind of stuff we send to that server. OK, let's go ahead and go to initial. And we're going to take a look. So first of all, we're on UDP port 443. And contained within this, within this datagram, if we come and take a look at this first quick, and this is called a packet. So by definition in the standard, this is a quick packet. Now I know, I know, I know you're thinking, wait a second, isn't IP a packet? You got an ethernet frame that, en that encompasses an IP packet. And then you have this UDP datagram. And then inside that is a quick packet. Yeah, so we're using the word packet. So I didn't make the rules, I just play by them. So this is actually a quick packet. Now at the beginning of a quick conversation, you have two types of, of uh, headers you can use. It's either a short header or a long header. A long header, like we can see here, has things like version and both directions of the connection ID, uh, token length, Blah, 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 blah. So some of, some of this other stuff that is only in the initial packet. You see, after you and I get up and running on our quick conversation, I don't need to have these. Let's see, this is four byte value right here, draft 29. Why would I use four bytes to communicate our draft number or, this, or the version of quick that we're using? Why would I burn four bytes in every single packet that I send you after the initial packet. 
kind of not efficient, right? So what they did is they went, you know what, we'll have a long header and that's going to communicate different stuff to the other side. But then after things get up and rolling, we can use something called a short header. In fact, let's go ahead and take a look at a short header. Come on down to packet, I don't know, 42, or just grab any of them that have a short header. So this is an example of a quick short header. So if I expand this out, this is a short header. So now we don't have that version. We only have the destination connection ID. We don't have anything about the source connection ID. Um, there's a few other values that just aren't here because it's just more efficient, right? It's just more like, okay, we don't need that anymore. We already talked about that. Here you go. Here's the minimal information we need to just keep this conversation going, right? That's what a long header is. Um, packet type initial. So this is like the first packet in the stream. And you can see there's a few different packet types here. We have initial and handshake. You can think of initial and handshake as basically, um, it's the handshake. It's getting things up and rolling. We're exchanging parameters. We're about to take a look at some of the quick parameters that get exchanged in the, in the technical handshake. But that initial packet is a special one. Um, this is the first one in the stream. And not only do we have this quick packet itself, but if you notice, we in the initial, we also have this second quick packet here. And basically what this is, it's just padding. So if you come over here to the hex values and you check out your, just click on that second quick packet, you can see all these zeros. So basically when you first send um, a quick datagram to the other side in that initial packet, check out its packet length. It's long. So Usually it's instead of like a TCP SYN, which is, is pretty small, you know, 74 bytes, depends on the options that are sent, but it's pretty small. Um, now coming out the gate, we use a large packet length. And there's a few reasons for that. One is uh, it's to prevent against amplification attacks. So DDoS attacks, if you will, or um, any type of attack, I mean, it's, it'd be a lot more heavy to initiate that type of attack where, where a TCP SYN attack, you can just hammer a server with a bunch of SYNs and those are small packets. But if you're gonna slam a, a connection with a bunch of initial packets, you're gonna have to do a whole lot more lifting to do so. Um, and also to, to, if this guy doesn't work at all, if this, um, if, if this payload size doesn't work in this network connection at all, well, then the rest of the connection is not gonna work either, right? Where we had an opposite problem with TCP. Sometimes the handshake would work fine, you know, small packets, but then as soon as you start using it, as soon as you start sending an MSS to the other side, uh, that's where something could get dropped or broken because we had an MTU problem in the middle um, or, or something like that. Uh, there was, here, let me go ahead and check. There's, uh, da, 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 da. I'm just scanning through the chat, okay. Well, we do have some questions here. Let me go ahead and, sorry, I start, get, I start rolling and I, I forget to, uh, da, 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 da. hey, Rich had a question. Would quick be cached? So the next time the client went to that website, it wouldn't have to do H2? Sure, yeah, that's the eventual idea. In fact, um, quick even goes to the point where there's an option within Quick to where we're setting up our TLS handshake in a connection. There's even an option within Quick where we can just begin to send application traffic to a server that we've already recently communicated with and a stream, a connection can live on. Um, and I can just do, it's called zero RTT. So instead of needing to set up this handshake all over again and get the TLS connection running again, um, and the possibility exists where the next time I could just come with this initial packet and actually have application data carried in the actual first packet. All right, so I've got a lot to get to, guys. So I apologize for not having more time with you. Anyway, okay, so I've, there's a few things I want to show you with Quick that are super cool. So let's go ahead and take a look back at packet number 33. We're going to expand um, this packet, this Quick packet here. And here, we have our connection identifiers. So the connection ID, here we have the destination connection ID. So I am saying to YouTube here, I'm gonna use this connection ID for you. This is the connection ID that I'm gonna to talk to. Here's my source connection ID. I'm at 931833. Think of these two numbers 
basically is a similar idea that you would to, uh, to port numbers, if you will, but just put them up a level. When I go and I talk to this connection ID on that destination, and I'm using on the source side, I'm using 931833, that now identifies this connection. So quick, we can change the IP addresses or the underlying port numbers. Let's just say that I had a NAT timeout and I had to roll port numbers in some way. Well, see, that would break TCP. TCP is not very happy with that. It, it wants to see the same four tuple, the source IP, dust IP, and then the ports. Those can't change with TCP, but quick doesn't care. It's like, look, my identification number is way up here. So you guys can change this stuff down here and I'll just roll to that new connection. I'll just go to a new IP pair and a new port pair. I don't care as long as my connection is in place. All right, so there's more things that happen under the hood to ensure that you're not just some new person that's coming on in. But basically that's part of the connection migration that can exist with Quick. We can migrate to a new network. Also, um, let's go ahead and take a look at right here, right out the gate in an initial packet, we are sending a client hello, the first packet of our TLS conversation, our TLS handshake, we're sending it straight over. So this is one of the reasons why Quick is marginally faster, right? Or it, it's poised to be faster. It's because we don't have to do a TCP three-way handshake. We don't have to do SIN, SIN, ACK, ACK, TLS, client, hello, right? We can send the client hello right away with the first packet. All right, um, let's keep digging here. If I come down to, all right, we have server name. Uh, someone raised their hand. I keep seeing a hand raised. Okay, sorry, I don't see the associated question with the individual that raised their hand. Um, I'm going to just mention a couple more things because I'm running out of, of time and I'm trying to answer those questions while, while I go in here. But basically what I want to do is I want to get you down to this TLS extension. So go ahead and check out with uh, packet 33 and I'm coming down to the TLS extension and check this out. Quick transport parameters. This is a new thing. So this is a TLS extension that where we are extending to our link partner and we're saying, hey, Here's some of the quick parameters that we're going to use for the life of this connection. So things like, for example, how many streams are we going to support? Uh, what's the source connection ID on this side? Um, are we going to enable or disable active migration to a new network connection? Um, there are several different things that you can almost think of them almost like TCP options, if you will. Right, so max stream data, bi-directional. Um, in fact, yeah, max idle timeout, three is 30,000 milliseconds. So there's several different quick specific parameters that I'm communicating to the other side using a TLS extension in the initial packet. Okay, cool. Let's see what the server sends back. All right, gonna take a look at packet 36. And the server sends back its server hello, and it starts to send some of the TLS 1.3 stuff. And after this initial packet, if I didn't have the key log, then I wouldn't be able to see anything past that. I would only see the short header, which is super limited. I wouldn't be able to see uh, H3. I wouldn't be able to see anything else in the, the handshake setup or nothing like that. If I come into packet 29, if I take a look at my handshake protocol encrypted extensions, I'm gonna come down to uh, quick transport parameters. So this is coming back from the server. Check out what the server is saying. Hey, Chris, what's going on? Um, yeah, that's cool. Let's go ahead and use this connection ID. I'm done with that. Um, how about our max UDP payload size, 1472? Kind of is acting like an MSS, no? Um, initial max streams. Bidirectional, unidirectional. Server is like, hey, I can handle 100 bidirectional streams, 103 unidirectional streams. So basically, these streams, think of each one of these streams that we're going to start to see in Quick as its own. It's almost like a TCP stream sitting on top 
of UDP. It's almost like I can have a hundred TCP streams over one UDP channel, if you will. And each one of those streams handles its own um, loss detection and retransmission. It handles its own congestion avoidance or, or congestion algorithm. So how much do I send without causing my own loss and so on? So, so these values here are exchanged in that initial, um, that initial uh, those initial packets, right? And that's where we're exchanging our uh, client and server hellos and also establishing our encryption. Once this is done, now moving down a little bit, we can start to see this connection actually begin to use uh, these streams. We're gonna to start to see short headers. And now we can actually see HTTP uh, begin to use streams and as those get set up and so on. All right, I'm gonna pause and back up a minute because I know you guys have some questions coming in and I only have a few more minutes. But look, this is a lot to take in with quick. And I'm, I'm just giving you a nice little intro. Hopefully it doesn't look too horrifically scary, but here's the way to boil it down. Quick is basically an encrypted form of TCP, but instead of a single TCP stream, now it's think of it as a bunch of different TCP streams sitting on top of one UDP channel, okay? And we're encrypted past UDP, basically. All we get is just the very beginning part here, like a short header and, and a connection ID. And that's all we can see unless we can decrypt quick. All right, let me come into the q and I just wanna see if you guys have some questions, go ahead and uh, ask away. Um, let me back up to David. Sorry, David, you had a question a while back. Would a web browser-based printer controller interfaces make use of Quick due to the small data rates they use? It's just a management console, so that's web-based. Possibly, absolutely a use case for, uh, for Quick HTTP3 using Quick. Um, Abed asked, how many streams can it do in H3? Um, yeah, so like you've seen here, I mean, this was an example where the client was saying, hey, I can do 16, um, I can generate 16 streams. How about you on the other side? Um, as far as an upper limit, I don't recall. I know the standard mentions one, but I don't remember what it is. So if anyone could Google that quick, I, I, quick. Uh, I'd appreciate it, but I mean, it can support many streams. So over a single connection. Juan asked, how do you get the quick keys? Same way as TLS today, yes. In fact, if you were here for uh, Ross's, uh, earlier today, Ross did a TLS 1.3 um, session where he showed how to set an environment variable in your operating system to be able to store the keys off of Chrome. Uh, that is exactly how I captured these keys exactly the same way. Um, TL, it's TLS. TLS didn't change. So uh, TLS can stuff those keys into a key log and then we can use those to decrypt quick. All right. Uh, question from Kevin S. Can current generation enterprise TLS interception boxes decrypt quick? Again, um, don't think of them as decrypting quick as a separate protocol. They're decrypting TLS. So in theory, for all intents and purposes, as long as they're able to recognize a UDP stream of data as an encrypted stream, if they're not only looking at TCP, then in theory, yes. Um, the keys are exactly the same. So TLS 1.3 on top of TCP or TLS 1.3 embedded into Quick is exactly the same protocol. Rashid, how does Quick change your capture process and review? Plus, what do you do if you don't have session keys? Great question, Rashid. Okay. How does it change my, my uh, capture process? Well, we have to be able to collect the keys at the same time that we're actually generating the packets, right? Because the keys are session based. So the keys for this quick stream are different than the keys for this quick stream. So we actually have to store them while capturing. Um, and typically, it's just easiest physically on the client. Yeah, I'm just telling you, it's just the easiest. At least when, at least when you're getting started with analyzing quick and taking a look at it, 
So dumping those keys to a key log while capturing your traffic as you're using whatever application. Um, what do you do if you don't have decryption though? Well, let me switch profiles and come over here. So right here, I just switch profiles and I don't have the encryption, the decryption keys in this profile. I don't know if you, if you realize this, but um, each profile stores the location of the key uniquely. So you can be in one profile. I have two quick profiles. The first one had the, the uh, decryption key, but my second quick profile does not. So that's why I just flipped over to my second quick profile. So this one doesn't have the location of the key. That's why it's not decrypted. If I saw, um, if I saw HTTP3 here, then that would be decrypted, but I don't have it. So what do I get if I don't have any decryption? Well, I can go, I can see my initial packet here. And let's actually go down and take a look at the, the stuff that we still can see even without decrypting. Well, we can almost just like we're troubleshooting any um, TLS conversation without decrypting it. Uh, we do get some of the handshake protocol stuff. So I can still see for now, I can still see the server name that I'm talking to. Um, I can see the LPN. So the next protocol that we want to begin speaking once we're encrypted. And I can also come down and I can see the quick transport parameters off of the initial packet. Then I see a response come from the server. If I come over here and right click on that first packet, I can set unset time reference. This gives me a measurement of my network round trip time. So here's my initial and then the initial coming back from the server, that's 31 milliseconds. So almost like measuring the delta between the SYN and SYNAC in a TCP handshake, I can still measure the network round trip time in the initial. Here's the, the bummer part though. So here's packet 36, I'm looking at the server hello. After this part of the handshake, see what the server does is the server's kind of smart. It just gives us just enough to be able to flip to encrypted after this very initial part of the server hello. In fact, the server even breaks its hello, if you will, in half <laughs> or, in, or in sections. It sends just this little snippet over to me unencrypted and everything after that point is going to be encrypted. In fact, let's take a look at packet number. Uh, here we go, packet 39. So from packet 39 down, we're encrypted and this is all we get. We get to know if we're at a long or short header. We can see our connection IDs and then it's just payload. So we can see IDs, but we can't even see past this coming down into quick. Uh, just I'm just picking a packet a little farther down. A short header, a connection ID, and payload. That's all we get. So how do you troubleshoot that? Woo! Very, very, very carefully. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's so encrypted, but that's kind of the point, right? And this is why there's a, a lot of, uh, um, there's some in the industry that are like, forget that thing. I can't inspect it, so I don't want it running around my networks. So that's why they block quick in some cases. Because, yeah, once, once the connection gets going, if we can't decrypt it, we don't have a whole lot to go after. Go, go, uh, go, go off of, okay? Okay, can I show you the decryption process again real briefly? If I go up to Wireshark preferences and I go to protocols, this is where I can stuff the key into TLS. All right, so I gotta go down to TLS and I gotta give it the, um, the log file name. That's where I, I give it the, the log that I gave you. Have I seen any of the quick implementations using the spin bit? Carl asked that, you know, I haven't really looked for them. So no, I haven't noticed it, but it's not something that I've also gone looking for. So hopefully that's helpful, Carl. Juan asked again, so what's the best way to clear the quick cache in case we're trying to ensure that we're capturing the initial negotiation and not just the substreams? What's the best way to clear the quick cache? 
I imagine shutting the browser and starting it over, right? Like just like you would um, if you want to kick off a TCP connection and, and capture the handshakes, you have to actually close the app down in many cases and you have to start it over and then do whatever it was you're doing. Um, same way with Quick, I would just close the tab, close the browser, bring it back up, and then you can make sure that you get those initial packets. All right. Abed says, we use Riverbed Transaction Analyzer agent to capture between servers and troubleshoot. Is there a way for it to decrypt there? To be honest, I don't know if they do it on the fly with Quick. I don't know. I'll have to ask uh, someone with more chops on the Riverbed side of things than I. Chris, I think we got to wrap up. Okay, well, hey, tell you what, guys, I'm going to jump over to Discord, and I'm going to answer as many more questions as I can over there. I'm, I'm very sorry I wasn't able to get to more. I think Quick could be a whole day on its own, right? It's a exciting new protocol that we see out there that stands poised to take on some of that TCP workload. Thank you all for dropping in. Again, I'm going to head on over to Discord. We can chat there. Please bring your questions over. I'm happy to do everything that I can to help out. Welcome to Quick. Don't fear it. Embrace it. Decrypt it. Study it. And if you have any further questions, come find me and reach out. Great uh, seeing you all, and we'll see you around Shark Fest. All right. Take care, and thanks for dropping in.